So welcome back. We're now ready to, to do estimation, estimation of binary response models, such as Cropit and Logit, uh, where we have a prediction of the uh, probability for y equal to one conditional on x um, being bounded between zero and one, okay? Uh, so, so um, you know, you, generally you can say that really empirical analysis largely consists of three steps, okay? Where the first step, that will be, you know, you need to ensure identification. Uh, we had established that uh, given, say, the no scaled normalization we did for the probit and logit. Um, and identification has to do with the uh, enterprise of finding out if you can actually, if in the, in the hypothetical situation where you observe the entire population density for, for the random variables y and x, would you be able to exactly back out what the uh, parameters are, are of the distribution were? So in this case, you know, beta or beta divided by sigma, okay? So, so that's, that's the identification step. Then, then you know, given that you have identification, what you can hold, you can, you find you can use an estimator such as you know the maximum likelihood estimator on nonlinear least squares or you know GMM or uh, you know whatever estimator you find suitable for your problem, and if that estimator is uh, to be consistent, well you better have identification, okay? Because otherwise, even in the best case where you have the access to the population density of the data, well then you then you would not be able to uh, estimate. Uh, the the model parameters. And then the last step that's about pretty much about you know inference and and uh, you know would say something about how precise our estimates are and 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 you know making counterfactual predictions. So we are in the second step and we kind of verified uh, the conditions necessary for to obtain identification in a binary response model uh, linear index models such as probability. So this is what we're going to do now. So in order to estimate, well, we need data, right? Um, so, so we're gonna have a random sample um, of, of both y and x, and we have uh, n observations, and we assume that these, you know, I, I, these individual observation indexed by i are randomly uh, uh, distributed. Okay, so, um, so, so given the random sample, um, so we can we can basically compute the uh, density of on an observation yi conditional on an observation of the explanatory variables uh, y, yx or, or xi, okay? So, so we have already spe pre previously specified uh, the conditional density for binary, binary outcome models with uh, probabilities being specified by some uh, model. The probability for y equal to one would be g of x beta in this case. Um, so, so we just, you know, substituting that in to, to get our uh, model for the conditional density of, of y given x evaluated at the data. And then everywhere where x and y was before as, you know, treated as, as, as random variables or generic values of x, well, then we put in the data that we have observed. Okay, so this means that we have like a, 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 a we can compute the density of y or i conditional on an observation of xi, okay? And we, we really want to maximize uh, that, right? Because, you know, we, we want to basically maximize the probability that we observe y given that we have observed x, okay? So that, that would be like maximum like that. We'll do that for, for, for all the observations. Uh, then we, you know, we take the log because it's, it makes it more well behaved and we, you know, uh, we get the log likelihood contributions Really, we're just taking locks here, and you know how you know how to uh, take take locks of, of products and and exponents, and that that gives exactly what we have down here, right? So we just take uh, take locks, and the product becomes sums, and the exponent moves down to to be multiplied in front of it. So so that's 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 pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, so this means now we have the log likelihood contribution for observation number i. And of course, you know, the log likelihood depends on the data, right? But we wanna, you know, we wanna move around the parameters so that that log likelihood contribution is maximized, you know, on average in the population, okay? Um, and, and, and so, so here we kind of highlight that it's a function of the, the, uh, of the parameters that we are trying to estimate. 
Um, and, and then, you know, summing over all the observations or averaging over the, all the observation, well, then, then we get the, you know, the sample log likelihood function. Here it's expressed uh, in terms of the average log likelihood. Sometimes it's, this, you know, the, the sum of the likelihoods, which would be like the, 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 the likelihood function, uh, the log likelihood function. Um, it doesn't make a difference for the maximum when you are trying to maximize this guy here with respect to beta, it doesn't, you know, this is just really a, a scale. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter for where the maximum is. So where, what beta is maximizing that function, whether you divide within or you don't. It can actually make, you know, especially if you have lots of observations, uh, it can make it, it more numerical stable to work with the average likelihood uh, because then, you know, you know, if you have millions of millions of, 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 you know, small numbers, then you get like a very big, big, small number that can be, you know, harder to work with on the computer. And um, yeah, so, so yeah, anyway, so we work with the, the average likelihood. So in order to estimate the model, what you do is simply you maximize this function here with respect to beta. And you've just been through uh, the course in numerical analysis. We had about optimization. So you know how to optimize functions. There's you know, many different algorithms to do that. One would be like you know, Newton's method or so, uh, some gradient-based or uh, um, maximization routine where you would uh, need to calculate you know, the, the derivatives and also the second order derivatives. Okay, or at least some approximation of the, the second order derivatives. Okay, so, so uh, it, therefore it can be useful to, to back out or to calculate what is the derivatives of the uh, likelihood contribution. And as you've seen too previously, when we looked at, you know, when you, when you, when you want to do inference and, and calculate, uh, you know, the variance covariance matrix for this estimator, well, then you need, you know, to take the derivatives of the objective function um, uh, you know, the first order derivatives to get the, the, the scores and the second order derivatives to get the, the, the Hessian. And, and these feed into to the, uh, our expressions for the variance covariance matrices that we need to get standard errors for, uh, for our estimator. But for now, let's just focus on how to get the estimator. And for that, it's actually useful to have the derivatives. So here, here's just a, you know, a sample computation of the derivatives. Um, for, for, for the log likelihood contribution. So we are differentiating, this, this means we differentiate the log likelihood contribution with respect to beta, okay? Now, um, so suppose that we have like P parameters, then this is like a P dimensional vector, okay? Um, and, and, and this is just a scale, at least for each observation of R. And, and how do you get, I mean, you can do, you can do the differentiation um, so, so here it's really, you know, log does not depend on beta, uh, y does not depend on beta. So that's just a constant, we keep that, right? Then we want to differentiate the log that's one over what is inside. So, so you got that right down, down here, then you multiply with the inner derivative. So it's let's just using the chain rule uh, and, and the inner derivative of G, well, that's small g. So the, because, you know, the, uh, the, the, the capital G, uh, that's the CDF and the small g, that's the, that's the, its derivative or the, uh, the, the density function. Um, so that's what we have here, but then we also need to differentiate, you know, use, use another step in the state chain rule and differentiate what we have inside here with respect to a change in beta, which is, you know, X beta differentiated um, uh, with respect to beta. Well, that's just XI, right? So, so um, and here XI, remember XI, that's a vector, right? So. This is where uh, uh, this is where you get get the the uh, the vector dimension here, right? So this is this x here that that is basically one by by k if you have k explanatory variables. Um, so in x beta, well, that's just a scalar. So so this is a scalar, and this is a scalar, and this is a scalar. So you got something which is like uh, um, you know. Uh, has as many elements as you have parameter elements in the parameter vector beta. Okay, now that was just the, the first term, and you know you can do the second term. It's 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 you know a similar um, um, si similar use of you know differentiating logs and uh, and and using the chain rule. Um, so so you can you can do that. 
And then the last step is really just putting on the same denominator. So this is, this is an analytical expression of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the derivative of the log of a likelihood. Okay, now this is not so hard to compute, right? And we have actually, uh, 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 it's, it's not hard, uh, uh, it's actually not much harder to compute the derivative than to compute the, the, um, the likelihood itself. Okay, I mean, you know, you, we, we, and, and, I mean, you can sometimes you can just compute G up front, right? And then it's just, you know, putting a, a, a couple of things together. Whereas if you were to do this numerically, well, then you would have to do like, you know, finite differences, uh, making, small, making small changes in beta, and then evaluate that uh, likelihood function uh, for, uh, you know, in the baseline, and then changing parameter one, and then change parameter two, and then change parameter three, and then all the way, you know, make p changes to the parameters or p perturbations, and then compute, you know, the difference to the baseline divided by the size of the change, okay? So this means by specifying the analytical gradients, you avoid calculating the likelihood function, uh, you know, as many times as you have parameters just to get the derivatives. And, and you can see, you know, the, the, this goes, the, the same is, is true for the second order derivatives. So if you were to be able to, to pin those down and, and the formula is, 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 is equally, oh, it's, it's, a, it's some, somewhat more complicated, but computationally, it doesn't take more, much more time to compute than just calculate the, the value of the likelihood function itself. Of course, it's a, um, um, it, there's some more elements, but it's, uh, sometimes likelihood functions can be take a lot of time to evaluate if you have like big data sets or the, 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 the likelihood function itself is very complicated. So in short, if you take the effort to actually code up the derivatives, you're gonna, your program is gonna run much faster and also uh, you know, more, more stable okay? uh, and be less prone to numerical error and so on because of the finite differences. So, that's why, uh, you know, we do this. So that's 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 kind of the likelihood, and essentially, you just throw that after your minimization routine. Tell the minimization routine that that your derivatives is is looking something like this, right? Okay, I mean, you you need to take the basically you need to, need to take the the average of those those derivatives over the sample if that is your this is your objective function, but you know you kind of get the you get the idea. I hope. <laughs> okay, so here's a, here's a Python implementation of the um, like likelihood contributions and their derivatives. Okay, so essentially what you have here is basically an implementation of uh, what you have on this slide here. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's uh, go back. So um, it's taking the log likelihood contribution here is taking the data. Okay, so you need you know, observations of, of y and x. Here I'm assuming really that, that y is, is a, some, uh, you know, n-dimensional uh, 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 array, and then uh, uh, x here is a, is, is a matrix that, um, that, that is, you know, n by, a, n by k, where each column corresponds to an explanatory variable, okay? So you have k explanatory variables. So this is what y is. y is n by one, and then, X is uh, uh, um, n by k. Then we need also to give, in order to you know be able to evaluate the likelihood, we also need to know what beta is, right? Because you know beta that enters right here, uh, so so that enters into the likelihood contributions, and therefore also the likelihood. So we need to know beta. Okay, the, 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 these are the key inputs. And then there's some settings here. You can choose, uh, you know, either the probit model or you could choose. Uh, to output different things and, and there's some defaults there. Okay, so having kind of, you know, uh, I'm doing a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, compensation for my lack of Python skills here, just to make sure that I'm sure that, that beta is really uh, K by one, okay? Um, sometimes, you know, you lose the, the last dimension uh, that says there is one column um, that's an uh, annoying Python artifact uh, that, that keeps annoying people who works with linear algebra and is used to MATLAB, but you know, what can you do? Okay, so I'm doing that. And then here, basically I'm calculating the linear index, 
which is, uh, you know, the matrix product of X and beta. So, so this is the X beta you see everywhere in the slides. Okay, so, so it's really a sum of X1, beta 1, X2, beta 2, X, uh, you know, all the way up to XK times beta K. Okay, so, so that's, that's what you get here. That, that's our linear index. Then we throw that into our, our model for the response probability. So in case it's appropriate, well, then that will be the CDF of the standard normal. And we already coded up this, those functions higher up in this notebook, okay? So, uh, so G takes, takes the input X beta and model, okay? And model can be either probate or logit. Uh, if it's probate, well, it's the CDF of the standard normal. If it's logit, well, then it's the CDF of the, uh, of the standard logistic distribution, okay? With different variances and, and all that, okay? Then what I'm doing here is I'm trimming really those predicted probabilities for, for the outcome y equal to one. And the reason why I'm doing that is because sometimes when you search over the parameter space, you can get beta x betas, at least for some observations that result in very, very low probabilities, okay? You put those into to, to, to the CDF of the standard normal and you get either zero, very, very, you know, like 10, you know, 10 to the power of minus 250, or, you know, you get something that is very, very close to one, okay? See, the problem with the zeros is really, you know, pretty nasty, right? Because if you want to maximize the likelihood function, once you put, put and you take the locks, then you take lock of those probabilities. And if probabilities are suddenly equal to zero, well, then you get negative infinity. And, and negative infinity, well, that's not good on the computer. And it may be that that is not really the case at the true parameters, that, but, but it, uh, that, that it predicts negative inf uh, uh, infinity log likelihood or, 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 or likelihood contributions that are equal to zero. That, that may not be the case or you know, hopefully not. But when, as you search over these parameters, then you know, X beta can be a lot of different things. Okay? So you wanna avoid that uh, that problem of taking the locks, okay? Makes the problem very numerically unstable. Okay, so that's why I'm doing that trimming here. And, and, and um, so, so this is something that, you know, you have to think about when you are, are implementing stuff on a computer. You know, it has to be numerically stable. Okay, so then we move on and then we got the lock of the likelihood, which is really what, uh, what you see here. The lock of uh, the, probability the y is equal to one, like our g of x now trimmed, times the observed outcome y. Okay, now y is an n by one vector. And this is also an n by one vector, so this is all right. Okay, so now we get like an n by one vector of log likelihood contributions. Okay, that is for the people who have y equal to, 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 to one, that is a log likelihood contribution. Then you got a similar one where, where y is equal to, to zero, you got this is a log likelihood contribution, okay? So this is just the, the formula you have right here, just implemented in Python, okay? Now, then if you, if this is what you asked for, well, then this function returned this vector of log likelihood contributions. Of course, this is not what we maximize, right? We, you know, we can't maximize all of these likelihood contributions at the same time. So when we work uh, to do estimation, we will take this function and then sum all those elements and then maximize that or actually minimize the negative of it. Now we also have the gradients, okay? And you, if, if, if you are not asking for the out, output of the gradients, well, it's returning here. So it's not computing anything here. It's not spending time down here. So, uh, if, but if you ask for say the, the, the derivative of the log likelihood, well, it's gonna continue, right? Because out is not equal to log L. And then we calculate the, the, the density at X beta, which is you know, the density of the standard normal distribution if we are in probit and density of the, uh, of the standard logistic distribution if it's a logit. Um, and then we just implement the formula we had right here, okay? Um, and, and, and so this is just like one-to-one -one a tra translation of what you had on the previous slide, okay? So, um, you know, gx times uh, x times uh, y minus g. Well, do we have that? Well, that's what we have. And then g times one minus g. 
That's what we have. Okay, so this is that's actually some link between theory and computer code. That's good. Okay, so that's our derivatives. In case you you ask for everything, well, then I just return uh, everything that is computed because sometimes it's it's nice to have you know it's it's the same function. I want to avoid you know writing the same code uh, 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 different uh, you know different places so that you you know you make one bug one place where you do not cor correct the cor correct the other places anyway. So that's 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 just a little log likelihood contribution. Well, it's not enough to get the log likelihood contribution. We want to have the estimator, right? So we want to maximize the the um, the average of those log uh, likelihoods with respect to beta, and that's our estimator. The 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 maximum likelihood estimator is the argument that maximizes the average of those likelihoods over the sample. Okay, like you know, or the population. Uh, the population counterparts, well, that would be the expected log of a likelihood. Um, but then we use the analogy principle to, to, to estimate that expectation using, using the data. So we take the, you know, replace the expectation with the sample average. Okay, so, so this, is, this is just maximum likelihood. And we already specified this and, and, and we essentially just need to maximize it. Now you can easily uh, rewrite this as a minimization Problem, um, uh, so so that it comes in the form of an M estimator, meter, which is like the argument that minimizes the sample sum of some objective function um, average over a random sample. That's an M estimator, right? So you 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 th that's what that's what, what what Jesper talked about. So this means that you know this estimator, the uh, B, beta MLE. Is is also an M estimator and inherit all the properties of M estimators, including those uh, theorems for um, uh, for asymptotic normality and consistency of that estimator. If you have identification and whatnot, and you know Borel multiplicity and, and all that, uh, you know regularity conditions uh, that you know you should not worry about. So it's an M estimator if uh, we specify Q uh, so that these two equations are the same. And that is done if you say, okay, now our W here, our data set, our random observation from the random sample is Y and X. And then you got our parameters, theta here, that's, that's beta, that's what we want to estimate. And then Q is the negative of the log likelihood contribution, which is like the, the objective that we want to, uh, to minimize. Okay, like maximize the log likelihood or minimize the, um, Minimize the negative of the log like. Um, so, so that's kind of you know uh, that's some quick theory. And now we come to implementations of this. Okay. So really, what you 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 what we are doing here is we already coded up the likelihood function. So we have a we have some code that returns that that returns a vector of all these guys. Okay. Now we want to maximize then uh, that or that's that average or the negative of, uh, of, of that average. Okay, so this is what we do. First thing first, we need a maximization routine. So I, I, I didn't you know, uh, import that earlier. So we're using some canned routine uh, in SciPy, it's called minimize. Okay, so, so we use minimize. And you can you know, check the, the uh, documentation that there's, that's a lots of you know, bells and whistles and uh, what type of estimator you're using, what you know, con convergence criteria and so on. I'm just going to use it like straight up, uh, make with no changes, with the all the defaults in place. And 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 here, this is really sufficient because what we see is that the these these binary response models really have like uh, um, well-behaved objective functions that are easy to maximize. The the objective function or, or the the, like, the the likelihood function for the logic model is, for example, globally concave. Okay, so this means that you know you can't really uh, screw up much of the maximization of the logic model just as long as you have identification. Okay, so how do we do the estimation? So first we we will like pass uh, our 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 data in. So X, that's I'm, I'm just making sure it's still an ant non prior array. This is uh, probably uh, you know you can do this better. I want to get uh, the 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 numbers uh, the dimensions of this. So this is. Uh, N and K, that is the number of observations and the number of explanatory variables, or so the number of columns in X. And then uh, again, I want to make sure that Y is, uh, is, is, uh, is N by one. Okay, so, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm lo not losing this last uh, um, dimension. And you know, feel free to, to educate me how, how to get rid of this annoying thing. Um, okay, so that's, that's just you know, making sure that, that X and Y has the right shapes. So, um, and then 
um, we're ready to like specify the objective function. Okay, so now the objective function here, that's gonna be the negative of the mean of the likelihood. Okay, so, so here I call it Q, just to be in the shotgun of chapter 12 with objective functions called Q, okay? I, I, I here specify that it's a function of beta only. So this means that, that uh, this is like an anonymous function. So Q is really only has one input, which, which is beta. And, and so here, uh, this, this fun, the, whenever I, I call Q with beta, it's gonna use the, those inputs that are in the memory at this place. So for, for, for Y and X and, and model, um, so, so now Q, this is just holding those guys fixed and then only very beta. Okay, so now you have uh, some function, objective function of, uh, as a function of beta. Okay, this is what this is doing. I'm, I'm sure you, you know all about this. Now, so now we have the objective function, which is the negative of the average of the log likelihood contributions average over the same. Okay, that's what we want to minimize. Okay, in order to use the, the minimization routine in SciPy, well, you need starting values, right? You need, it's an iterative routine that start at some parameter vector and then it makes a step. Okay, and then it may, uh, so, and that step uh, that depends on derivatives and the second order derivatives that you learn from your, from your, from your course in optimization, in the optimization part of the, um, of the course uh, in numerical methods. Um, so, so we need starting values and we need uh, to specify what function, okay? And, and so uh, this is really just minimizing the function starting from the starting values uh, beta star, which I just take to be like a vector of zeros, okay? And of course here, what you need to keep in mind is that this vector needs to have the same size as the parameter vector we are trying to estimate. So this is K by one. Okay, now, you can do it without gradients, in which case you would not need to specify where the gradient is. Uh, you can do it with gradients. In this case, you would have to say that gradients is, is equal to one. And then we have to specify the gradient function too, right? Again, we use this anonymous function and then our gradients, that is like the derivatives of, the, of, of this objective function here. Well, that's just negative of the mean of the derivatives of the log likelihood contributions which you get if you give it the output D log, uh, uh, D log L, then you, I mean, we saw that previously right here, if that is the output, well, then it returns those derivatives that we calculated using this formula. So everything fits together. Okay, very, 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 very fun, very fun. I, I really love coding. Um, and, and then you minimize with uh, using the numerical, uh, the analytical gradients instead of using analytical gradients. So you can do both things with this uh, small routine. Okay, so I'm just gonna, you know, make sure I, I, I um, let me see, did I, uh, this is not evaluated, so we need to, um, uh, yeah, yeah, we need to, to, to evaluate that, right? Uh, okay, and then it's, you know, rock and roll. Try to see, does it do something? And it does, okay, so now it's maximizing, uh, um, this likelihood function that we had here on the previous slide um, that we you know, specified or in, in several chunks of code um, using minimize and then it's outputting this out. So out is really output from minimize, from this minimize. And how does that look like? Oh, sorry, so it's a di dictionary with a bunch of information and it's, it's, it's returning something called fun which is the function value at the converged, uh, at the converged estimates, if it's converged. So here it's 0 0.53. What is that? Well, log of probabilities are between zero and one, well, that should be negative, right? But we are minimizing the negative of the log likelihood. So it's actually uh, the, the negative of the average log likelihood, which is zero, minus zero, the, the, that would be uh, minus 0 0.53, okay? That, that would be our average log likelihood contributions, okay? Then it also gets you the Hessian, okay? Now that's a matrix of second order derivatives. And you can see there's a bunch of stuff uh, going on here. Really it's a, it's a, a, a K by K matrix if you have K explains or variables. Uh, it's a little bit ugly here, but this is, this is really what it is. This is what you need to calculate the variance covariance matrix, right? You know that from, from the theorems in, in the chapter uh, um, um, 13 about maximum likelihood, right? That you can use the, uh, the inverse of the Hessian divided by N as the variance covariance matrix for the for, for the betas. Okay, so it's it's 
it's giving, giving you those as a byproduct of the maximization routine. These are calculated numerically, uh, although we're using the, uh, the, the, the Jacobian, so we are, we are differentiating only once with respect to the parameter vector. Um, the Jacobian with respect to the parameter vector. And that's kind of, you know, that's a detail. So, but, but it, it gives you the, the inverse of the Hessian, okay? Then it also gives you the Jacobian. And, and this is like the derivative of the negative of the log likelihood. We want those to be zero, right? Otherwise you don't have a maximum. Uh, and so, so it, it all looks good. They're, they're very, very small. Um, and, um, and then uh, there's also a message saying uh, optimi optimization terminally it's terminated successfully. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't really see everything here. <laughs> I need to zoom out. Okay, so let's do that. It, it also gives you right at the end, it gives uh, X, which is the vector of parameters that maximize that function. Okay, now this is actually our parameter estimate. Okay, and why don't we, you know, put this nice, uh, in, you know, package this a little bit more nicely uh, and, you know, um, and, and kind of structure this into some estimation output. This is what I'm doing here. And it's really just using the, um, some, some uh, using the output I got from, from, from minimize um, and, and, you know, putting into some nice tables. Okay, so, so what I'm printing here first, this is, I, I, for short, I just want to see, have a list of the different keys. I, uh, there is in the dictionary uh, that was the, the output here, or, you know, this, this, uh, these are all the different keys. So you have fun and Hessian inverse and Jacobian message and whatnot. This is all listed right here, right? Okay, so I print that out so I, I know what, what is going on. Um, and then there's the, the uh, optimization message that's, I'm printing that out here. Uh, and then I'm printing out uh, the number of iterations, the number of function evaluations and the number of uh, Jacobian evaluations. And you can see that that was, there were 33 iterations, uh, 37 function evaluations and 37 evaluations of the Jacobian. That, that was what was required to estimate this model with these eight parameters. Now, which is probably not too bad. We're using BF, uh, BFGS, so we're not like using Newton's method with an exact Hessian. So that's, that's probably what to expect. Um, so, 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 so that's, uh, that's nice. One thing I wanna show you actually, now we're talking about this is what happened if we didn't decide not to use the gradients? So we just, you know, let the minimize use numerical gradients. What happens to these numbers? What you see here is now you have 333 evaluations instead of, um, I think, 30, 37, okay? So, and this is exactly because, you know, you need to do all these perturbations of the, um, of, of, of the um, parameters to get those finer difference approximations of the, of the gradients. Uh, whereas we are not doing that when we're supplying it, it's just calculating that those uh, uh, from that function. Okay, so obviously now if you have like K parameters, well, then if you wanna calculate the, the, the gradients numerically, well, then you need to, to calculate, um, you need to calculate the objective functions K plus one times. Uh, and that can take time, especially uh, you know in larger samples or in more complicated models, not like the, like like the poker model. So so that's kind of you know some motivation for actually doing numerical uh, derivatives. Um, so what's the next output? The next thing here I'm, I'm doing is well I'm I'm getting the the number of observations, and then I'm using the uh, uh, I'm, I'm using the the inverse of the Hessian divided by n. Well, that's that's actually uh, an, an a pro that's a, an, a valid approximation of the uh, variance covariance matrix, the asymptotic variance covariance matrix of the estimator. You know, this is like this is a this is a k by k matrix. We have k parameters, so you have the variance covariance matrix between all those. Tell something about how, what is how much is of these parameters varying in the sample and varying together. Now, if you want to have standard errors, that's really the, the standard deviations of each individual estimate. Okay, so that's the square root of the diagonal elements of that matrix. So this is really what I'm calculating. I'm taking the square root of the diagonal elements of that variance covariance matrix. That's my standard errors. 
Okay, and th this is this is uh, this is what I put into SE, and then I collect all the stuff in a table. This also, you know, I divide uh, beta uh, with standard errors, and you get the t values. Okay, you know, which should be roughly you know greater than two if you have a significant estimate. So uh, this is all good. Um, you see here, um, you know, uh, you, you get different, uh, you know, different estimates. Are they intuitive? Well, I would say they're pretty intuitive. We're talking about here uh, the dependent variable. I didn't even talk about what we're estimating. We're estimating uh, basically the same model we estimated with the linear probability model. So this this is the the labor force participation um, um, for uh, uh, for female. Uh, married workers, uh, the 700 and, and um, the 753 observations uh, from from Rulich. and and um, <clears throat> what are you what are you getting here? Okay, so we have a constant. Okay, that kind of just gives the overall the overall level of the average probability to to fix that. Okay, so that on average the number of uh, people in the sample match actually the the uh, the observed number of of people choosing y equal to one. Okay, so that's positive. Okay, uh, but let's look at the interpretation of um, so some of the other explanatory variables. Okay, so we have so for instance uh, education. Okay, so that's that's positive. Okay, so um, it's positive and significant because the standard error is you know relatively small, so we get like a t value of five, so it's pretty significant. And it's and it it means that uh, if the if beta is uh, positive, it means that the probability prob if you give people more education, they're more likely to uh, participate in labor market. That's pretty intuitive. You also see there's this experience and experience squared. So it seems like you know for small values of experience, then experience uh, uh, increases the probability. I haven't calculated the shape of that function, but it looks like it's kind of increasing, and then it's you know, um, then it's it, 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 it's kind of the, the effect of experience is is decreasing. Very intuitive, very intuitive. So more experienced workers are more likely to be you know participating in the labor market, um, and then you got effects of of children of uh, having small children. Which is is highly negative. So female labor force participation is kind of discouraged by having small children at home, whereas it doesn't seem to have an effect, a big effect, when, when those children are created that are older than six years old. So so these are kind of intuitive estimates. But what do they mean? I mean, can we really uh, say how much based on these estimates? And then we have to you know remind ourselves that that it's really only the, the coefficients beta. They, they're not saying anything uh, in themselves about um, the overall scale of, of, of the um, uh, of, of that um, uh, of, you know you, you can scale up all the parameters and then that scale up the variance and then you would have a different set of estimates. So if you were to estimate profit uh, uh, instead of, of logit, you would get something else. So let's let's try to see if you just write profit here. Uh, do the same thing again, and then, well, what happens to the estimates? Uh, let's look at uh, education estimates is 0 0.22, and now it's suddenly uh, 0 0.13. Does it mean that the um, that the marginal effect is predicted to be smaller if you estimate by appropriate? No, it just means that it's scaled by a different variance. Okay? So we need to keep that in mind when you interpret the uh, the parameter estimates. I'm going to put it back to logit um, and, and, and do a little bit of you know, estimation. There's some more things to output here. I'm, I think I'm outputting also uh, a, a chi-square test for, for the gradients being, being equal to zero. And it, it really shows that those gradients are very close to zero. And then I think what you can't see here is really the Jacobian, but that was uh, that, that, that you can see right here. That's, that's very close to zero. You know, kind of showing that it's converged. Sometimes it can be good to scale that those gradients by by you know, dividing by the uh, by the, the the variance, so multiplying by the inverse of the Hessian, um, which because you know the Hessian is the uh, basically the derivative. Uh, <coughs> the Hessian is is uh, actually a, a variance, uh, a good estimate of the variance of the gradients. Uh, as the text says in the in, in the chapter about um, maximum likelihood, 
Um, so, so this is actually like a chi-square chi test for, um, um, for, for gradings being equal to zero. When you calculate uh, this quadratic form, the Jacobian divided by the Hessian the, the times, times, uh, times the Jacobian, that is chi-square distributed with number of degrees of freedom equal to the number of, uh, of, of parameters. So, and that's, that's clearly, I mean, even if there was one parameter, that's, that's clearly above or below the critical value. So we can, we, we can safely say that, that this, is, this should be converged that, uh, um, that uh, x, uh, that, that the gradients are, are actually equal to zero given the sample. We can reject that based on the data. Anyway, so, so that, was, that was how we got our estimates, okay? The first set of estimates. We didn't wanna do more. And now the second step of uh, empirical analysis, that's, that's, uh, that's inference. We already did a little bit. So uh, we, we got those variance covariance matrices and really uh, I'm, I'm taking a little bit uh, on this, this slide here, we were taking a little bit, going a little bit ahead because we didn't talk about the, the, that variance covariance matrix, uh, you know, in, in right of the Greek letters, but this is really where, where, we, where we have it, right? The, it's the uh, negative of the expected value of the Hessian, at least for maximum likelihood, uh, if you uh, use the, the information identity. And then that was actually what, what we got an approximation of already. But uh, here, uh, a little difference to what we're doing on this slide uh, is that before we were calculating these Hessians numerically, and not really using the structure of the model to calculate the expectation, but using the data uh, by simply just averaging over all the different Hessian contributions for all the different, uh, uh, you know, um, all the different observations. So it's like, you know, the sample analog of this expectation, which is taken with respect to, to, uh, to the distribution of X. So, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's what we have, but we can actually calculate that expectation in, in this case, because we know the, the distribution of, uh, of the dependent variable. So, um, so, so we, can, we can actually uh, calculate that, that expectation. So here, what you can do is simply, now we, we take the, the second order derivative, the Hessian, that's the second order derivative. So I'm using a little bit of time to going through this, these tedious details because you know, uh, one day you have to differentiate your own model, right? <laughs> Um, but, 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 but so, so, so and, and then these steps are kind of the same. It's just differentiating twice. Okay? Uh, so we already got the derivative uh, of, of the log likelihood contributions uh, uh, with respect to the parameters differentiated once. Now we just need to you know, differentiate once more. So this is just the, really the derivative of those uh, um, expressions we have uh, over here this differentiated with respect to beta. And now you can see it becomes a little bit more nasty, okay? Uh, and actually uh, trying to differentiate that, that expression with respect to beta becomes a little bit nasty because beta is appearing in so many places, right? So there's all these, you know, product rules and, you know, and fractions and, and, uh, and repeated use of, of chain rules and so on. I'm not gonna bother you with this. Woolrich writes up what the derivative is um, and it has really this, this form. So, it, it's this, uh, this first part here that kind of looks nice. And then it's uh, the conditional, um, and then it's uh, Y minus uh, G times some function L, which is a function of the parameters in X. Okay, so, so importantly, um, um, uh, it, it, if you take the conditional expectation of this, you know, holding fixed, holding fixed X, so that X appears as a constant, you take that conditional expectation. Well, what is it? Then you can put this outside that conditional expectation operator and calculate this. And what is the conditional expectation of, of, of Y minus G? Well, that's a conditional expectation of Y given X. And, and, and this is only depends on X. So this is just G of X. So now you have basically uh, the uh, conditional expectation of y given x minus g of x, but these are supposed to be the same, right? This is this is uh, uh, the model. So this term here is essentially zero. Okay, so this basically this complicated term just drops out once we take the expectations. Um, 
So, so then we are left with this, uh, and 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 we can calculate that. Still depends on on x, right? So this is our given observation of x, and then we can get the sample analog taking the you know we need to take the expectation over x. We do that with the sample analog uh, by simply just averaging over all the observations of this uh, this expression. So we are left with this. Okay, so. Um, so this is kind of all the steps you, you, you need to do in order to do the, um, the, the, the or to get an estimate of the, um, the asymptotic variance of the uh, maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, in this particular example for this binary response model or with, where you have a linear index model. So, so that's, uh, that, that's one formula, but, but remember there's several different formulas you can use, right? You can also use the outer product of the gradients or you can use the, uh, or the outer product of the scores and you can use the, the, the numerical calculated Hessians like with that. So there's several, several ways you can use the sandwich formula, which would be A inverse B times A inverse. Um, uh, depending on whether you think the model is, is correctly specified so that you the information identity holds. I think, I'm sure, yes, but he talked about, ab about that, okay. Um, but but here is, here's just a few implementations of different A bars. The first one we already talked about, you got right here, okay. Uh, this is what you return if you, you, you give the option A inv, then you get, uh, then you get the, uh, what we just talked about, okay. Then there's also, or the alternative is to use the outer product of the gradients or, or the outer product of the scores. And here you, you, you can calculate it by this uh, matrix product here. You can verify this is really just a sum, the, the uh, outer product of, of, of the scores or summed over all the observations. Um, and uh, that's, that's our, our estimate for B. Uh, and then you, you can get, use that. Uh, and and under, under the information identity, well, B and A is supposed to be the same, right? Uh, if the model is well specified and at the true parameters as N go to infinity and all that. Um, or you can use the, 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 the sandwich formula. If some of those, um, some of those uh, um, assumptions for the, for the information identity needing to hold is not satisfied, then you'll use the, the sandwich formula. Okay? So like, you know, for instance, if the model is, is not well specified, uh, then, uh, then we'll, we'll use that. Okay? So, and here you can see in our case, they are actually pretty identical. Okay, so you get the, the tr three different ways of calculating the standard errors based on, 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 on this formula, or that was calculating the expected value of the Hessian. The, uh, the one that used the, the sample uh, average of the uh, outer product of the scores or, or the, the sandwich formula that provides sim very similar estimates or of, the, of the standard errors. Okay. And, and again, here we say the square root of the uh, diagonal elements uh, for, for those variance covariance matrices. That really here, I'm just looping over the different types of, of, um, of, of you know, variances and I compute it, store it in B, take the square root of the diagonal elements, print it out, and then you get this. So, so you know, this is um, nice. I mean, really the easiest thing to do is, is actually calculating this guy here um, because it only requires us to calculate the first order derivative. So no second order differentiation and, and uh, very easy to compute, okay? Which is a valid, uh, estimator for the variance covariance matrix for maximum likelihood due to the, that information identity. So it's much easier to compute. So why not use that sometimes? Okay, so um, yeah, I think we already did this, right? The, uh, the comparison of the results with and without uh, analytical derivatives, we saw that we got, we needed more functional evaluations with, with uh, if, if we are not using the analytical gradient. So this is just what this is doing. I'm just gonna uh, move on. Now, this is, uh, so what are we gonna do now? We're gonna actually um, try to see if we can replicate the results, the empirical results in Woolridge on page uh, 580. I got the book here, very nice book, very nice book. Uh, where is 580? Well, there is a table there and hopefully you have a table in your book too, okay? Now, what is this table? You know, this, is, this is what you see. Okay, okay, you can't see it. it. I have it here. 
It's a table uh, uh, that shows uh, estimates for the linear probability model, the logic model, and the proper model together with with uh, some additional uh, output. So let's try to see if we can we can do this. You know, uh, compare all the different results. Okay? And I can see in my book uh, that what I get here is pretty much matching what is in Wolf's textbook. So. Um, so how did I do that? Well, I estimated a linear probability model. We know the, how, how to do that by OLS. I estimated both probit and logit looping over this, the, the, uh, over the estimation for those two models here using uh, like my, my uh, uh, routine for, for estimating uh, linear index models by, or probit and logit models, stored that into to the, the, some output dictionary for, for each model. Uh, where I, I saved the betas or the, the estimates or from, from the uh, uh, minimize, the, the, the parameter vector that minimized it for, from that output. I, I used the, the variance covariance matrix using the function we just went through. Um, so here's, here's the, uh, uh, I'm using the, uh, the, the variance covariance matrix that we had on the slides and with the great Greek letters. So the one that's based on the expe you know, conditional expectation of the he Hessian. Um, um, so, so uh, basically, um, uh, uh, this formula right here, I'm using that. So, um, and uh, what, what the more are we calculating? We're computing the, the standard errors against the square root of the diagonal elements of that variance covariance matrix. That's the standard deviations of those uh, of that estimator, which is what we call the standard error. And then essentially we just plot that stuff out in a nice table and that's what you see down there. Again, we got the linear probability model that's estimated by, by probit. I can verify here in my book, well, you got the same estimates and the same standard errors, okay? And, and here I'm actually using the robust standard errors just like Woolwich did. Um, so uh, I saved that previously uh, when we do, did that. And then you got the, the estimates for probit and, and for logit. And you see they're, they're very different. Um, the, the estimates for probit and logit are, are, are very different. But if you compare, say, education, um, say, uh, the, 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 the coefficient on education uh, to uh, the coefficient on experience, well, they're, they're on similar magnitude, right? Okay, so I mean, they're you know, 1.3 and 1. 0 0.13, 0 0.12, and, and they're also uh, similar magnitude. And actually this one is, is smaller than this one here, just like the coefficient on, on, on education for the probit model is slightly smaller. Okay, so it looks like the relative size of these two parameters is actually pretty identical. So if you actually calculate those relatively, you're gonna get something that's very, very similar. Um, and again, like we talked before, we can really interpret about what the magnitude uh, of the effects is uh, based, based on these estimates, only the direction. Okay, I'm gonna show you that uh, actually in that later form. Now that, that was just replicating those results and uh, now we can also get, get some additional output. So in the textbook, I see here there's numbers of observations, there's something called personally correct predicted. I've not calculated that, you know, that I leave you guys to, to code up yourself. There's a lock likelihood value for, for, for logit and probit. And I get in Walrus textbook for, for logit minus 401, which is also uh, what, you, what you see here, the same for, for, for probit. So uh, it, it all adds up. So uh, what is this pseudo R square? Well, we know how to calculate R squared for a linear model, but that's just, you know, uh, the usual formula, calculate the residuals based on the model, then take the, uh, you know, one minus residual sum squared divided by uh, basically um, um, uh, the explained sum of squares. So, so, um, so that's, 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 that's uh, our, if, um, that's a formula for, for um, our, our squared for a linear model. We can, we can easily do that for the linear model. But what about the, um, what about nonlinear models? You can't really, uh, there's not a similar uh, expression. There's something called the pseudo R squared. And that's, that's what we're gonna use. The pseudo R squared, that is defined as one minus, and this is what we calculate where, where is that pseudo R squared here? It's one minus the log likelihood contribution 
for our estimated model divided by the log likelihood distribution of some other model. Okay, and that other model is the restricted model where we only estimate the constant. So how do we do that? So first up here, I, 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 you know, I, I make a constant, which is just essentially you know, the, the column of ones that we have in the data set. Um, but you can actually, uh, yeah, so, so, so that's what you have here, right? And then basically I estimate uh, the models uh, um, with only a constant. Um, and, um, and then I save that um, here, uh, 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 that, that function value here, um, that, that's, that's the, the function value, that's the negative of the average log likelihood. So we need to multiply minus one, right? To get the log likelihood, uh, average log likelihood by N to get the, the sum of the likelihoods. Okay, and this is what we need. This is the likelihood. Okay, remember it was, uh, you know, minus 0.53 uh, before, now we'll multiply by n, so it becomes around 400, okay? Um, so that's for the restricted model. And, and for the restricted model, the lack, lack, likelihood is much smaller. Why? Because we used, we, we, all those additional variables that we included in our model, you know, education, experience, experience squared, kids, you know, uh, non-wife uh, non income, what not all these explanatory variables, they, they contribute to explain uh, the outcome variable Y and therefore improves the likelihood, okay? That, make, that gives the likelihood a, a bigger likelihood. So, so the likelihood for our model that, is, um, that has more explanatory variables has a, 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 is higher, okay? Compared to the one that only has a constant. And actually you can make a joint test of significance by something called the, the likelihood ratio test that we read about in chapter 13, uh, that will be two times the, uh, uh, the, the difference in log likelihood between the, the estimated model and the restricted model. Okay? And here, that, that difference is, is actually pretty big. It's, it's like 113 and then multiply by two. And then you really, even in a, a chi-square distribution with, um, with, uh, I guess we have eight parameters, so eight, eight degrees of freedom. Oh, we have to subtract the constants and we're estimating that in the restricted model. So that's seven degrees of freedom. Um, then that difference is really, uh, you know, bigger uh, uh, than, than uh, um, uh, the critical value. So it's those differences are significant. Okay, so it's under the null that they're the same. Well, it's gonna be chi-square distributed. But uh, you know, under the alternative, it's not chi-squared distributed, so so it's going to you know be outside the 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 uh, this, the, the chi-squared distribution of, uh, of with seven degrees of freedom. Anyway, you can you can try to work that out uh, that uh, your, that likelihood ratio test you, yourself. And you know, I get I bet without you remembering exactly uh, the, the, the that distribution. That, that this is uh, jointly really very, very significant. That's a big difference in, in log likelihoods. Now that was the, that was the two, these two log likelihoods, but actually the pseudo R squared that we kind of started talking about, that is one minus the ratio between those two uh, uh, log likelihoods. So uh, this is supposed to be, uh, it's guaranteed to be between zero and one. Why? Well, if, um, suppose that, that the model with the full model with all the explanatory variables does not add any explanatory power and therefore do not improve the likelihood that we have served Y conditional on those, all those explanatory variables, uh, then the likelihood from the unrestricted model is gonna be equal to the likelihood of the restricted model, okay? So these two likelihoods would be very different, would be very, uh, uh, would be identical if all the explanatory variables except for the constant were not adding any uh, uh, explanatory power, okay? So what does that mean? So then you have the pseudo R squared, that's one minus the ratio of the two. So that's one minus one, that's zero, okay? So in other words, in the case, in the extreme case where these explanatory variables that you're adding above the constant is not adding any explanatory power, well then R pseudo R squared is equal to zero, which kind of makes sense, right? So that means like, you know, you're not explaining anything more than just the constant. Then in the other extreme, we have a perfect fit 
from your with your with your with your estimated model, these eight explanatory variables just perfectly predict each of the outcomes. So the this means that that the conditional density for all the observations of y, that's f of y given x that we calculate, that is just equal to one for all the observations. Okay, because you know the model. And the estimated parameters perfectly predict all the outcomes. Okay. Then you take the log of all those ones and average them. That's going to give you zero, right? Like like log of a bunch of ones. That's uh, uh, at the average of a bunch of zeros, right? So so in that case, the log likelihood contribution is like the 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 best you can get is zero in this model, right? Um, is going to be is going to be zero. So what do we have in this case, or the pseudo law squared? Well, that is um, one minus zero divided by, you know, 400 and something, okay? That is zero. So you got one minus zero, that's one. So the pseudo law squared is gonna be equal to one if the model perfectly predicts um, the outcome. So in that sense, uh, the, the pseudo law squared is, is at least have uh, the interpretation at the two extremes. If it's zero, it, you know, explanatory variables explain nothing. If it's one, it explains everything, all the variation in the data. In between, well, it's really not, um, it's not really a fraction of the, uh, of the variation in the data uh, explained by the model as it is in the linear model. But, you know, we kind of use it as that. And that's also why we we uh, call it pseudo squared. So it's kind of a measure of goodness of fit between zero and one. Okay, so that's that's kind of that's kind of what we, we I have for you today. These two slides, uh, uh, goodness of fit, and the previous one here that replicates Tapple um, fifteen one on page five hundred twenty. I really encourage you to like, you know, see what happens if I say change some of the explanatory variables. If I move an explan uh, remove an explanatory explanatory variable, move around, try to see if you can, you know, play around with the code yourself. Now, we, we, we kind of already said that we can't really interpret the scale because of the identification issue here, only the, the you know, the direction. And, and in order to get something or uh, uh, that, uh, get an estimate of what is the magnitude of a change in education on the outcome, uh, on the probability of participating in the labor market in this case, um, then we need to calculate partial effects. And that's the next thing. Uh, that's for the next video. So, you know, take a little bit, break, have a coffee, play with some Python code and make ready for the next video, which is about partial effects.